We're delighted today to interview John Tierman on his latest book, The Deaths of Others, The Fate of Civilians in America's Wars. John Tierman is a principal research scientist and the executive director at the MIT Center for International Studies. And I'm Michelle Nooch, director of public programs at CIS. Welcome, and let's jump right in. Your book, The Deaths of Others, is a grave look at our alleged indifference to civilian casualties of America's wars. I'm just curious, what led you to explore this topic? Well, I've been interested in human security issues for a long time, how we regard, how we treat civilians in all kinds of situations, not just wartime, but in, uh, in economic development agencies and projects. Uh, in our foreign policy generally. So this has been a long-standing concern of mine, but the specific stimulus for this book was actually the the first mortality study that was done in Iraq in, in 2004, uh, about uh, 18 months after the war began. It was done by some Johns Hopkins researchers, um, and they 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 got fairly startling results, which was that 100,000 people uh, had been killed in the war to that point, a, a number that was far larger than even the sort of scattered estimates that were appearing in the news media. And yet this remarkable study, a uh, scientific study done by a household survey in Iraq, um, got very little attention in the news media. Uh, and in fact was disparaged to the extent it got any attention uh, as being political or unscientific and so on. And I, and I, I marveled at this response. Um, it seemed to me that the American news media, the government, um, other institutions, and the public at large should have been very interested actually in the number of people who were being killed in a war that we began. Uh, and over time, I grew more and more interested in this issue and, in fact, commissioned the second survey that this, uh, this same group of researchers did from Johns Hopkins and were published in The Lancet, the British medical journal. That second survey, which I was involved with uh, in terms of promoting and interpreting the results, uh, got more attention, partly because we... we uh, we manage the public relations aspect of it, but it still kind of died on the vine after a few weeks. It generated a lot of controversy, but indeed over a period of time, the news media reverted to these lower numbers. Um, we had found 600,000 dead in the war as of June 2006. Um, and so I started to puzzle over this question. Why aren't we paying more attention to people who are dying in American wars? Uh, and that led to looking back at Korea and Vietnam, the earlier Desert Storm conflict in, in Iraq, uh, and that led to the book. Wow. So in your study of these major wars that involved um, the United States, what were some of the common themes? Well, the three wars that I looked at uh, did have some, several common themes, actually, and it was quite striking to see this come out in the research. Um, the wars in general have followed a pattern of public engagement that one might describe as um, early in the war a rally around the flag phenomenon in which the war was very popular uh, with the American public. Uh, then gradual growing uh, sort of disappointment or uh, a lack of interest in the war itself. You know, Korea is often described as the forgotten war. Um, Vietnam was not a forgotten war partly because the news media was different by the late 1960s and early 70s, much more attention to the war, more television coverage, for example. There was a large anti-war protests, but in fact, in public opinion, it followed a very similar pattern to Korea. Early rally around the flag, then gradual um, belief that it was a mistake to go in there. And Iraq followed the same pattern. The 2003 invasion followed the same pattern. These did not, these three wars did not have the same uh, time scale to this 
to this trajectory of public opinion, but, but it was very striking how similar it was. In, in terms of the civilian casualties issue, this also followed, I think, similar patterns or characteristics. There was very little attention to civilian casualties in Korea, even though three million people died in the war in a very short period of time, about three years. There was massive bombing of North Korea, particularly uh, after MacArthur withdrew from the Yalu River uh, on the border with China and the Chinese entered the war, the United States retreated. Um, and by the end of the first year of the war, it then became uh, a stalemate in which there was tremendous bombing of the North in particular. Never any really expressed concern about the civilians uh, in Korea during those three years. Vietnam was a little different again because of the anti-war movement. The larger attention from the news media, especially some really outstanding journalists like Jonathan Schell and Neil Sheehan, David Halberstam, Gloria Emerson, a few others. Um, but in the public at large, again, there was not much evidence that they cared about the Vietnamese people themselves. Uh, in fact, a couple of uh, opinion surveys seem to demonstrate very low concern uh, in terms of, of civilian casualties being a, a reason to oppose the war, for example, a question that was asked uh, once, as far as I know, in about 1972 or so. And then Iraq, uh, again, has followed about the same pattern. Um, rally around the flag, the decline in interest, and very little concern, as far as we can tell, for Iraqi civilians, and I think this is what accounts for the controversy regarding household surveys that we commissioned that um, people simply didn't want to hear about the scale of mayhem in Iraq. Uh, and so a, a growing indifference to the war uh, was really evident in a, there was less news media coverage, there was very little uh, discussion about the civilian casualties or the five million refugees or the lack of clean water, the lack of education, the lack of health care services, and so on. And that continues, actually, to this day. There's still violence in Iraq. Uh, it's still a very dysfunctional society, and yet we're leaving uh, and not thinking about it very much. Hmm. Well, you ask these questions in your book, and I'm going to ask them to you now. Um, for instance, you know, why are civilians treated so badly? Why does this mistreatment persist under U.S. political and military leadership? And why are Americans so indifferent to these massive human tragedies? I'm just curious what sort of answers you found. Well, um, it's the question of whether or not the U.S. military actually intentionally harms civilians is a very contentious one. I mean, there's no document that says we're going to hurt civilians. There's no really accounting for how and why civilians are harmed except for uh, what are called after-action reports that the military gathers um, and has done so in, in uh, Vietnam and other wars in which a commanding officer will write a report about what happened in a particular day or particular encounter. Um, and these are, these are not uh, more than just sort of straight reporting. There's not much interpretation. So we don't really have very many accounts of, of the engagement of U.S. forces with civilians. But what we do know when we look closely is that lots of civilians are hurt. Many are killed. Uh, in Iraq, it's been mostly at, at checkpoints, roadblocks, um, and convoys, house-to-house -house searches, which are had been very common uh, once the resistance to American occupation rose. Um, some from bombing, although not nearly as much from bombing in Iraq as there was in Vietnam or Korea because the, the lines of, uh, of the, the battle, so to speak, were much clearer in Korea and Vietnam than they have been in Iraq. But we know that lots and lots of civilians are hurt in these cases. And I think the concern uh, among military officers, especially mid-level military officers, captains to colonels, um, is mostly with force protection, as they call it, that is protecting our uh, 
um, our forces from harm, um, and and achieving certain missions, clearing a village of terrorists, as they would call them, or um, securing some other strategic advantage, a road, uh, um, a particular position. Um, and so the concern for civilians, which sometimes are very difficult to differentiate from fighters anyway, the concern for civilians falls very low on the scale of concern of the military. And this was true in Vietnam, this was true in Korea, uh, especially in the early fighting that took place in the South. Uh, and so civilians are sort of an afterthought to the U.S. military, and that's really part of the problem here, is that we're fighting wars uh, in which civilians are going to be hurt, uh, and they, uh, we have to ask the question, how and why are we fighting these wars? Um, it's also true in Iraq, as it was true to some extent in Vietnam and Korea, that once we enter as an occupying force, um, it's our obligation under the Geneva Conventions um, to provide security. And in Iraq particularly, the inter-ethnic fighting and sectarian fighting that occurred uh, and is still occurring in Iraq, the lack of security, um, which may not have to do with American forces per se, but other uh, fighters, uh, insurgents, militias, and so on, um, it's nonetheless our responsibility to provide security once we go in. So even in those cases where we are not the proximate cause of harm, uh, we still have a responsibility. And this is widely ignored, I think, in American society and the press. Mm. You refer to this uh, phenomenon as collective autism. And um, I'm just curious, do you do find this to be a global phenomenon? Um, this indifference to civilian casualties? Well, the indifference comes, I think, um, in for a number of different reasons. Um, and yes, it's broader than what we've seen in American wars. Um, my theory that I develop in this book um, is that indifference rises for, for three or four different reasons. One is... Um, and I think this is really the main reason, is that people simply do not want to deal with the horror of war. That is, um, and this comes from a, from, a, from a psychological impulse of not wanting to believe that your world, the world that we inhabit, which we like to think is orderly and rational, you don't like to think that that, that world can be disrupted in some way that seems unjust or inexplicable. And when, when injustices occur, we often avert our eyes from them. I mean, the, the classic example, um, and something that's been tested by social psychologists, is sort of walking down the street and seeing someone begging in America. And this is usually a very disturbing uh, phenomenon to the observer, the person who's walking down the street. Because one likes to think that in America people don't have to go begging, basically, and it disrupts our sense of how the how the society is is constructed, and the psychological reaction to that beggar is often anger, or aversion, or, uh, or averting actually the um, uh, the beggar sort of not paying attention, ignoring it, or even blaming the victim. This is a very common thing that happens in these situations. If somebody's begging there in America, you shouldn't have to beg, and therefore it's the victim's fault. Well, you take that to a larger scale, a war, a war uh, abroad, where bad things are happening, not just to American soldiers, but, of course, to uh, millions, really, of people, whether Vietnam, Korea, or Iraq. and. Uh, it's hard to explain in terms of how we construct our worldview. I mean, we think of this intervention as being just. We think of ourselves as bringing a certain kind of order to uh, these misbegotten places um, that were liberators or protectors, and yet things go badly. And they've gone very badly in all three of these wars, right? Um, and so, the 
notion that there may be millions of people in Korea, in Vietnam, in Iraq, who have been killed, who have been maimed, who have lost uh, their, their husbands, their sons, their daughters, their mothers, uh, who may have been displaced, driven from their home, lost their home, forced to go into exile, uh, taken off to a detention camp. The idea that this is affecting millions of people is just too much psychologically for us to grapple with. And so we tend to, to ignore it, to, to neglect it. And this is, you might say this is a natural psychological phenomenon, but I think it's also prompted in part by the way that politicians deal with a war that's going badly, with the way the news media deals with it, it tends to reinforce indifference, tends to reinforce blaming the victim, and um, the result is uh, the phenomenon that I'm describing is this vast carelessness about, about the civilians we were meant to protect. So what did you, <clears throat> I'm just curious, um, you brought up media. What, have you discovered anything that, you know, today's new media has helped or and has there been a difference in? Well, the news media um, in Korea, of course, was very different from Vietnam or Iraq. Um, and the main difference, because of, mainly because of television, um, in, in Vietnam, um, the coverage was much more extensive. Of course, in those days, you had a news media industry which was very profitable and could afford extensive coverage of the war in Indochina, which included, of course, Cambodia and Laos to some extent. Um, in Iraq, you've had a combination of two things that made the coverage different. One was that the newspaper industry in particular is, is uh, on its knees and therefore can't afford to cover the war the way they, they had in Vietnam. Um, and secondly, you do have the Internet. And the Internet's um, contribution to uh, the, our understanding of the war in Iraq has mainly been through commentary rather than reportage. So you get very little new information actually from the internet unless you're able to access documents like what uh, the UN is producing or other NGOs that are there or um, other kinds of agencies that have on the ground reporting the uh, international um, crisis group for example. But um, there's been very little reporting. There's been mostly commentary. Mm -hmm. And uh, the commentary, one can um, find some very good commentary, um, like our friend Juan Cole at the University of Michigan has, has a blog that's very informative because he reads the Arabic press and he can, he can give us a different view of what's going on there. But by and large, the new media, I think, have been a disappointment with respect to the war in Iraq. And, and interestingly enough, I think that's, that's demonstrated by the way public opinion has changed. That is, it follows the same patterns of Korea and Vietnam. That is, the news media, the news media doesn't seem to have had that much effect. The new media hasn't had that much effect on public opinion. The same patterns seem to be holding. More broadly, I think that the, the war... Um, in Iraq was, was accepted by the major news media, uh, the rationale for the war, the intervention, the framing of the war by the, by the Bush administration. And it took a long time for them to start to question that. And the reporting never really quite kept up with, um, with the, the change of attitude about the war. That is, we still don't have many accounts of what's happening to ordinary people in Iraq. So I'm curious then, I mean, are there any signs that these trends are changing or is there any hope? Is there any hope? What well, that's a good question because it occurred to me after finishing the book that I did not leave much room for hope, um, which is not, uh, it's not my usual way of dealing with things. But I, I do think that... Um, well, there are two answers to this. Uh, one is that uh, 
um, the pattern that I describe in these three wars um, has not changed much, and therefore it's hard to see that the American public is suddenly going to become more engaged with the victims of war. Uh, on the other hand, there is the capacity uh, through new media and through new awareness, actually, of this problem, which has been raised very rarely, in fact. I mean, there's very, very few uh, voices over the years um, that are calling attention to the victims of war. Um, so if we just begin to address these issues in a more systematic way, finding out more information, I mean, the basic question of how many people have died in Iraq, for example, which the military should want to know because they should know as much as they can about what's going on in this theater of operation. Um, we should know for moral reasons. We, should, we have an accounting to do, right? Um, and we should also know because if we think that there are only a few tens of thousands of people who have died, only, I say, in quotation marks, um, which is now the number that is often bandied about in the major news media, uh, if we think it's only tens of thousands and that Saddam Hussein was vanquished as a result of this operation, then we might be led to believe that, well, uh, it, the costs, the human costs really weren't that high. Uh, it was worth it. And indeed, a number of, of right-wing commentators have made this claim uh, in the last couple of years. Well, it's unfortunate, but um, it was worth it to get rid of Saddam. But if you think that a million people died, and if you point out that five million people are still displaced eight years after the war began, um, you might come to a different conclusion. And I think that that's the kind of discussion that we have to have a more honest discussion about the costs of war, not just the costs to Americans, not the, the dead and wounded of American soldiers, uh, not the financial costs, which of course are quite substantial, but the cost to the people where the war is occurring, then we might think twice about starting another one, and we might think anew about how to um, how to compensate, how to deal with um, these victims, that they need things. They need a better health care system. Um, they need to be repatriated. They need a, an economy that is not fraught with corruption and, and dysfunction. Uh, this is true in Afghanistan as well, um, which is, it shows all the same patterns on a slightly smaller scale. Um, so if we can engage in just an honest discussion about this, uh, then maybe that will lead us to uh, a different way of approaching it from the standpoint of policy, but also about, about the American sort of consciousness. I mean, in what ways are we actually thinking consciously about victims? And can we come to terms with um, these, uh, the, this destruction that occurs in all wars. Um, it's not just in American wars, but we have, we have been the principal warrior since World War II, and therefore uh, much of the destruction uh, has been uh, at our hands. So we, we do have a special responsibility in this sense. And I hope in an open society that we have, we can we can grapple a little bit more uh, forthrightly with the, with the, with the consequences. Well, that would be great. Um, I guess my last question really is just, you know, what, what's next? What's <laughs> next? Idea. What's next about this issue? Yes. Well, we still have, you know, we, we still have two wars going on. We're moving out of Iraq, uh, and again, we're moving out of Iraq without thinking much about what, we've, what we're leaving behind. So we, we need to grapple with that. The, the destruction in Iraq has been colossal. Um, Afghanistan remains you know, an active war zone, and we need to think much more carefully about, about what the actual effects of the operation there have been. Um, we've, we have no good accounting of the number of people who have been killed there. Uh, we have some slightly conflicting information about the number of refugees and displaced. Uh, 
Um, it's a different society from Iraq. The war was conducted in a different way, so they're not truly comparable, except that they occurred at the same time and approximately for the same kinds of reasons. Um, but we, I'm arguing that we should, in fact, stay in Afghanistan and Iraq, not as warriors, but as builders, as, as, a, as a country that can commit some resources, some know-how, uh, some people, NGOs um, particularly, who can help reconstruct the country. Uh, it's very fashionable now uh, in the last couple of weeks particularly to say, no, we're not nation building in Afghanistan. We're done with that. Didn't work. We need to think about withdrawing. I think we have a real responsibility to Afghanistan. I think we have a responsibility to Iraq not to be intrusive and, and pour too much money in, which can be wasted, but to think about smart investments with ordinary people that can make their lives better uh, over the next 10 years or so. I hope that, that, uh, that our, our disgust with the war, our, our war exhaustion, um, and the persistent indifference that, uh, that we see with respect to both places uh, can be overcome and that we can, we can continue to engage responsibly for a number of years and repair some of the damage that we've done. Well, thank you, John. Thank you.